Hi, everyone, and welcome to Behind the Numbers. My name is Dave Bookbinder, and I'm a managing director at B. Riley Financial. I'm also the author of the new ROI, Return on Individuals, and welcome to the show that digs deeper to understand what matters most in business. Today, we're going to be talking about driving value by aligning with your private equity firm. And I'm pleased to welcome uh, a friend and a colleague and a guest who has been around private equity his entire career. Pleased to welcome John Bova. John, welcome to Behind the Numbers. Good morning, Dave. Thank you very much. Hey, John. So uh, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself before we get started? Sure. And thanks for that intro. And thanks to yourself for uh, giving me consideration for today and to RVN uh, Studios. So uh, I have been in private equity, as you've said, Dave, for a number of years. Started my career as a middle market executive driving value at family-owned companies and PE-backed companies and venture-backed and family office-backed. I then did a stint in professional services with advisory firms. And then most recently, I've joined uh, Amazon AWS, Amazon Web Services private equity practice, where we're driving value for private equity firms through digital innovation and technology enablement. Awesome. Thanks for that, John. And, and uh, congratulations on your new gig. I know you're going to do great there. Uh, let, let's talk about the primary reason why folks are involved with private equity, and that's growth and value creation. Talk a little bit about that. How do we achieve that? That's a great question. You know, I think as private equity deal teams, investment professionals, and, you know, let's take a step back. You know, private equity's primary function is raising funds from their limited partners, then returning it with, obviously, increased value and being able to make uh, their fees for themselves as they deserve. So it is pushing out that capital, that velocity of investment. Now, with that, those functions, private equity has done well from the beginning. Um, over time, um, the creating of value, managing of firms, how to really understand where in that value creation process the executives at those companies are, has been a varying degree of challenge depending on the private equity firm, how they were founded, how they were structured, what they consider most important, and also even most, most importantly, how intrusive they choose and wish to be to provide support for that value creation function. In, in my experience, I'd love to hear how you see it from your side, David. Um, look, there are three main levers of value creation. Top line growth, and that can be organic growth, you know, commercial transformation, revenue ops as a sub lever of getting that going. There's M&A. You know, they buy their first investment in a certain industry or certain type of stage of firm and they'll grow by continued acquisition of smaller uh, acquisitions that they call bolt-ons or add-ons. And those are generally done to provide some gap filler. And that gap filler can be, hey, we bought a great firm with great technology, but we don't have really a good sales team or we don't have global um, reach. So we'll buy a firm to help us along those lines. So that's generally the growth driver. Finance excellence, where you sit in that office of the CFO on finance excellence, finance efficiency, month-end reporting, all of that strength and function, especially Treasury, um, which rolls up to your controllers. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about the people in that as well. But that function is vitally critical for reporting and ensuring cash um, is being measured correctly. The third is technology enablement slash tech ops. Um, how are you using your tech stack to drive an operation and transform an operation? Those are really your three levers, and obviously within them there are many, many uh, le sub-levers you pull to start driving value. And to a point that you're very astute on, human capital kind of overlays all of it. I think that's more of a new realization, and really I think it's, it's always been realized that you have to have the right people in the right seats as quickly as possible. Probably the issue now is there's more intentionality and in understanding and underwriting the management team sooner. And if you're going to move on from certain people, how do you do it as efficiently and without any risk to the investment you're making? Yeah, uh, good salient points there, John. Uh, talk a little bit, if you would, about the concept of the, the, the roll-up strategy where companies may be acquired as a platform and then there's a bolt-on or an add-on acquisition in terms of you know, driving and scaling businesses for growth and value creation. What, what should entrepreneurs be thinking about um, in that context as a platform entity, if you will? Sure. You know, um, I, as I mentioned at the start, 
you know, the private equity men and women are in the business of velocity of deployment of invested capital to get return. Many times as they are looking at either sectors or segments or working with an investment banker to find said investments, a number of uh, alternatives pop up as they're looking within a certain industry. So very often, once they've really fixated on, hey, this is the right platform, it has the right growth potential, it has the right mix of customer concentration, it has a, you know, it has a strategy that is working for product development and service development. And they have found that first uh, starting point, so to say, they got the beachhead. Through that process, many times I've seen with clients that a few add-ons have emerged even at that stage. And they can be competitors, uh, niche providers in the space. They can be supply chain partners. So very often those add-ons start lining up potentially early. If they do not, you will find that the investment team really starts burning fast to find and identify. Now, this is where the trick starts to come in. The executives in the platform that they bought, you know, they're going to have some tribal knowledge from their years of being in the industry. Very often, however, many middle market platforms, and I'm going to broadly say companies with revenue of $100 million and lower, they generally don't have a strong management process, a strong strategic process. Hence, knowing what they're good at, identifying the adjacencies, they perhaps do not have anything other than anecdotal rather than a person who serves the role of corp dev or strategy. Hence, you have that beginning part of you have really good investors at the PE fund with ideas and opportunities that have come their way through their network or intermediaries. And you have a portfolio company that maybe doesn't really know where the gap is. And I always say that those first hundred days, and I think people who sell to the private equity space uh, can be shaken shake from a uh, dead sleep, and they could say 100-day plan and value creation. I think the key point, however, is they need to have a deployable, s- slow rolling process where they understand, do their executives know how to roll out the elements of a strategic plan so you can identify the gaps you want to fill, and then portfolio company of the fund and the investment professionals, I think, have a higher probability of successfully identifying where the add-on should come from and how it will help accelerate those growth numbers. John, for folks who are watching, listening, want to learn more about you or connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, some of the ways you can contact me, my name is John A. Bova. Um, I'm on Twitter at, at John A. Bova. Uh, I have a robust LinkedIn profile with that same name, and I, uh, my email contact information is available through that. Cool. John, we've got about three minutes to go here in this first segment, so I need you to keep this brief, but I want to sneak in one more question before commercial break, and, and that is if you can highlight for us, you know, for the entrepreneurs, business owners who are contemplating a potential uh, investment from private equity, what are some of the key things that they can do in advance of that to become more attractive? I would say, and if we're going to use the same kind of target, David, of a $100 million company in down that's privately held, family owned, I would say have your financial statements really scrub well. If you haven't been audited, please get yourself audited because that is going to slow down any kind of a deal. Secondly, you have to be behind your story of why your firm was successful. And for many entrepreneurs, you know, there's a little bit of um, luck. There's been being in the right place at the right time, but they really have to begin to crystallize the decisions they make when they took them and how that, you know, grew and made into a successful business that serves a community and they want to keep it that way. And I think they want to be very clear early on as they're engaging with their investment bankers to prepare them and some targets, the whole concept of who's going to remain behind? What does my management team look like? Who are going to be strong players? And what would be my role or my partner's role or my family's role in the ongoing basis? Those three points evolve other than, you know, the audit. You get an audit, you get an audit. But those other two points will evolve through the process, but they should be top of mind because it will just simply help the story remain consistent. 
Yeah, one of the things I always share with entrepreneurs is de-risking the business ultimately is going to impact and increase your valuation. And when you talk about getting audited financials, that's one key component of de-risking the historic financial performance. So thank you. Uh, John, don't go anywhere. We've got to pay a few bills here. Uh, you watching and listening, sit right there. We'll be right back on Behind the Numbers after this quick break. Dr. Mark and Liz from Marriage Matters, a show that inspires, instills hope, and empowers couples to weather the stresses of married life. Join us each week to hear how couples, real couples like you, have overcome challenges that were hurting their marriages, as well as getting expert advice on ways to nurture a happy and healthy relationship. Tune in Fridays at 4.30 p.m. and Thursdays at 9 a.m. on RVN TV. The new Kentucky Fried Chicken Sandwich with brioche buns, mayo, pickles, and a quarter pound filet as far as the eye can see. Get comfy, it's gonna be a while. This thing's huge. Get the new Kentucky Fried Chicken Sandwich for just $3.99. It's finger licking good. Have you heard? Join me, Heather Darling, weekly for a different spin on politics, business, law, and other key issues you will not want to miss right here on RVN TV. This crazy calzone from those brainiacs at Little Caesars. Is it more pizza or more calzone? Pizza. Calzone. Confused. Pizza. Pizza. Cal, cal, calzone. Both, both, both. We're oh. not big pizza. We're <laughs> Little Caesars. The new crazy calzone for eight forty nine. Pizza, pizza. Perfect timing. Your turn. <laughs> Nintendo Switch. That's my way to play. Pumpkin lovers, there's a whole new spin on pumpkin to love at Dunkin'. With our new pumpkin cream cold brew, topped with velvety pumpkin cream cold foam, or our pumpkin spice signature latte. Enjoy a medium for $3. That's how we pumpkin at Dunkin'. America runs on Dunkin'. Today tastes like it's all fired up. Like it's cooling down. Tastes like open air and closed eyes. Today tastes like a Sunday ritual. And it never tasted this good. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and today we're talking all things private equity with John Bova. Uh, John, I wanted to kick off the second segment by continuing uh, from a springboard in the first segment about life inside the private equity firm. What should management team expect living inside a PE-backed company will be as they transform from this independent entity? No, that's a great question. I think it's really the area where these investments go really right and where they do not go really right. Um, I think a few things, you know, private equity people, as you well know, David, you know, they came out of predominantly two areas of where they were trained. Public accounting when there was, you know, in the stages of our beginning of our career, Big Ten, or they came out of investment banking. So they became really astute on numbers. They became really astute on team play, long hours, um, and really doing a lot of collaboration so you have the best thoughts and ideas in a row. When you go to a family-owned company, as you know, or a partnership-type-owned company, management decisions are much more consolidated between the founders, owners, equity holders, and a few key employees. So I think where some of the struggles begin when you take the composition of the people and then you add 
what is a middle market privately held company kind of like before the equity event of private equity coming in their life. And one last point, um, those kind of people in private equity have historically made up your back office of PE and your investment teams, and to some extent the operating tier. But what has been the next trend is, you know, we have both seen uh, big consulting and big tech is a place where private equity firms are grabbing their operating partner tier of talent. And for those out there, an operating partner is um, a former executive, a former consultant, um, a former person in the game who can come in and help a private equity firm along those uh, value driver levers we discussed earlier, growth, finance, tech, human capital. So I think when you start to bring in people who have a short timeline, four to six years of an investment hold, you know, people who came out of some really rigorous places where they learned their craft, as I said, public accounting, investment banking, big consulting, firms like GE, ITW, Honeywell also make up a big tier of operating partners. And you go into a family owned, or as I said, a middle market business with not a lot of investment in strategy and upper management thinking, you have the crush of a few areas, speed, the speed at which PE expects adoption of new uh, reporting rigor, uh, consideration of how to upgrade an ERP and reporting system. How do you think about compensation? How do you think about how you're using your square footage of space to have a cost optimized operating model? All things that private equity people and management consultants generally think about daily. Whereas it, uh, a firm struggles to do those things because they basically have never really done it. They have a very simple playbook that has allowed them to grow and be relevant or grow, flatten, but still be efficient. Um, so there is a clash of cultures. And I think what I've seen as best practice to really try to mitigate it is the investment banker intermediary, the PE investor, and the management tier who will who have committed to stay in the investment after close really have to have a very uh, candid conversation about the expectations. Generally, a, a reporting cadence around the finance is the most critical, and then uh, a cadence of get together. There's always a quarterly board meeting because many of these firms, as you know, never had functioning boards. So they set up a board cadence, and these people now have to learn what a board's responsibilities are why it is there. Um, audit, as I said before, a lot of private equity firms are buying companies, even in that $50, $100 million rev tier that have never been audited, potentially reviewed, but never full audited. So there's another overlay. So you think about what year one is. Um, it's getting together, candidly speaking to one another, ensuring your financials are clean, potentially be audited, and learn to report. Um, I would say that the biggest challenge through all of that in year one is that the executives who are in the firm, if they have never worked in a PE-backed environment expecting transformation and speed of transformation, they don't know how to raise their hand, call the PE firm, and say, you know, I need some help here. I've never done it. I think if there would be confidence in the executives that are there and a level setting at the very early onset, you avoid a lot of problems because for that first year, besides all those things I discussed, like audit and ERP and technology upgrade and compensation and all the like, and how do you build a first really substantial strategic plan to identify potentially those add-on acquisitions we discussed? These are areas that many of these firms have not had good experience in, and it's really incumbent upon the executives raise their hand, tell the PE firm where they're going to be able to come up to speed quickly, where they are not, and let's come up with a plan to address this. Those type of candid conversations go a long way, not only in getting in that first year into that rhythm, but when things go bad, they know they have people who know how to articulate problems, and then things tend to get solved with much more transparency and speed to solution. Yeah, a lot of takeaways from that. Speed is something I've heard my clients say quite a bit uh, about as uh, they've entered into the private equity world, the cadence of reporting and the change in the rigor in which they're now reporting their data. And as you just mentioned about the importance of that first year when you think about the short 
holding period that these firms generally have in that four to six year window. Uh, John, for folks who want to know more about you, how can they connect with you? Sure. Um, I think the quickest way, john.a.bovagmail.com. Certainly as an employee of Amazon, I can certainly take email there as well at jabova at amazon.com. I think a good starting point, link in to me, follow me on Twitter, do the same with you to people listening, link in to David Bookbinder, follow him on Twitter, and we'll all be able to connect up with each other and have conversations. Thank you. Appreciate the plug there, John. You talked about tech ops as one of the key features for uh, value creation and, and growth, and you're now in a world where you're, you're seeing tech ops maybe in a slightly different lens than what you, you had previously. Talk a little bit about the importance of, of data and, and the, the, the concept of tech ops in terms of the value creation strategy. Absolutely. Thanks for that question. You know, um, I would say today in 2022, and uh, for all of us who sell into private equity or have been in private equity or in investment banking and advisory, I think it's an interesting time because compared to, say, even five or ten years ago, the adoption rate in private equity of technologies and softwares have never been higher. And by adoptions, um, that can mean enterprise softwares, ERP systems, CRM systems that run business. Um, the idea of creating a data lake where you put all your disparate data sets into from where your ERP and CRM systems will map and pull the updated synchronized data into. And then you have all the other areas. Um, dashboarding, basic BI and analytics so that you can create dashboards so the private equity firm and the portfolio company can align really quickly and make sure they can identify potential areas of concern much earlier. The CFO suite of a portfolio company tends to aggregate a lot of information and data as well. Not only do they have the GL through the ERP system and subledgers, but then they start to add on tools for month and close. FP&A functionality, um, other reporting um, assists. What tends to happen over time is that um, a portfolio company can start to accumulate a lot of technology and they all are running on potentially not the same core known good data set. Hence the need to really take a step back and understand what, where are you trying to go to. And I think the area that you keep coming back to and keep hearing is if we have a known good data set and we're aggregating all the data in that lake, it makes the migration off of and onto different softwares, technologies, reporting, migration from premises to cloud considerably easier. And that starts really with data governance and data management. And when portfolio companies have to take that into consideration as well on in year one, they typically have a big gap and they're going to lean into their private equity firm owners. One of the areas though is that those same kind of silos, not 100% optimized softwares, migration strategies, reporting upgrades are not particularly well done in private equity as well. So you think about the lift that just one portfolio company is doing that we're just battering back and forth on. Think about being at a PE firm and they have 40 or 50 portfolio companies and they're trying to aggregate and be on top of 40 to 50 type of data sets. So data is the problem in private equity. It is the bottleneck and it is the area where time needs to be spent at the fund level because their ability to actually clean that and strengthen it and make it more effective is just going to help them to do that at their portfolio companies. You have to have a leader in the fund who can evangelize it down to the portfolio companies. Yeah. John, we've got about uh, three or four minutes to go here in the program, but I wanted to ask you um, for some tips, some advice that you might offer. If you're on an elevator with an entrepreneur and they tell you, they tell you, hey, John, uh, I'm going to be meeting with private equity. What's, what's the key to success here? Uh, a couple items that you might be able to throw out to share with us? Absolutely. That's a great question because a lot of times private equity firms are introduced to entrepreneurs through referrals, if not through bankers, which let's face it, investment bankers selling companies to PE firms, it's a relationship basis. Sure. So I would say a couple quick things, you know, as I said in the beginning, have your value proposition, like why do you exist in your market? Why are you successful? And why do you need 
outside capital. And, you know, that may take some advisors and lawyers and people like your firm to help them articulate it. But they have to crystallize the story really well. And I think in the early conversations, transparency and honesty is a really important thing. Many, you know, middle market companies, as you well know, are very top line driven companies and top line driven companies maybe have a good roster of revenue. They have compensation done, but not finance or vice versa. I think transparency on where the strengths and weaknesses are in the operating model help the PE firm to understand, hey, this is what we're getting into so that the PE firm can never say at the 11th hour, gee, I didn't think, didn't realize you were not ready or built out. So I think that early transparency of getting to know each other, strengths and weaknesses, needs on both sides goes a tremendous way, Dave. Yeah, thank you, John. I'm going to sneak in one more because I think we've got another 60 seconds. So in, uh, in 60 seconds, talk about the importance of the human capital equation in this value creation process. Look, um, some executives who come into a private equity firm at the acquisition are going to be there at the exit. But there are tons of reports to show that 75% don't make it to exit, especially in the CEO and CFO suite. I think it's incumbent on private equity to really have their human capital and value creation playbook built out early, because then they will know if they can repeatedly identify talent that can drive value, or if they have to move on. And if they're going to do it, they need to do it quickly. Yeah, and maybe we can have you back another time and continue that conversation and the overall thread that we've had here today. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today, John. Great conversation. Thank you so much for being here, David, and I will take you up and come down to southern New Jersey and do this live next time. Sit here in the studio side by side. I'll tell you, it's a lot more fun in person. It's a great setup we have here at RVN TV. Thank you, John, and thank you. Have a good for day. Thanks, and thank you uh, at home for watching and listening to Behind the Numbers. We can't do this without you. Uh, please be sure to hit the subscribe button uh, so you can stay in contact with us and know what we're up to. Uh, I'm always open for a conversation as well, so you can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, like John mentioned. So until we meet again, you, you all stay well, take care, and we'll see you next time on Behind the Numbers.